So it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Alba Garzón Manjón. She is actually in the Max Planck Institute for uh, Eisen Forschung and PIE in Germany, in Dusseldorf. But she was uh, doing the PhD uh, between ICMAP, CESIC, that is our neighbors there, and UAB. Okay, and now she has been for five, six years. Almost six years. Almost six, six years in Germany. And she will join the ICN2 in September. So we are lucky to have uh, her here. So it's a pleasure to have you here and the floor is yours. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. So um, let me just start with a curiosity. Um, iron for Schung means in German iron research. So our max plan is the max plan for iron research. And today I would like to give you a taste of my research I was doing this last year. And I called this uh, presentation in situ transmission electron microscopy of multinary nanoparticles for energy applications. But main, I was working in two big projects. I was working with co some complex solid solutions for um, oxygen production reaction. And then I moved to a project of fuel cells where we study the catalytic materials, um, the degradation process of the course on the fuel cells. And today I will explain a little bit about these uh, two parts. Um, so um, before, okay, Jordi did it already, but yes, I finished my bachelor in chemistry here in Universitat de la Autonoma in 2011. Then I did my master in science and chemical technologies between yeah, the IGMAP and the UAB. And then I finished my PhD in chemistry that um, it was called synthesis of metal oxide nanoparticles for superconducting nanocomposite. Another application is we were doing also testing sodium oxide nanoparticles to reduce the stress, the oxidation process from, for the human cells. And yeah, this is a, a picture of myself uh, with the three members of the jury and uh, Josep Bros and Susana Ricard, and maybe some of you knows them, that they were my supervisors. After, um, in December 2016, I moved to Dusseldorf I really like this picture because normally we have a gray sky. So when the sun is shining, it's a really nice city. So I moved to Max Plan and I started as a postdoctoral research in the independent research group, nanoanalytics and interface that is lead for Professor Christina Shoy. And first, as I say, I was uh, exploring these complex solid solution nanomaterials by the use of advanced transmission and scanning electron microscopy. And then in 2019, I started as a project leader in the development of membrane electron assemblies, or we also call them shortly MEAS, for ultra long life for time fuel cells. Um, so our main mission is to determine the growth, the structure, and the properties relationships of these nanomaterials. And we develop strategies to improve the performance and their stability. So for the case of the complex soil solution, we use um, in situ uh, heating experiments, in situ beam crystallizations and other techniques. And as well for the case of the, um, and the fuel cells, we study some core nanomaterials made by ruthenium and platinum. And we study them by tomography, identical location, atom proof tomography, and et cetera, that you will see in the presentation. So our facilities at Maxplan, we have uh, four microscopes. We have two gels, 2100 and 2200, where then you can make in situ TM heating experiment, experiments, mechanical testing. And this is kind of an example of some, the growth of some nickel nanoparticles under the heating from the amorphous nickel hydroxide matrix. We also have one Titan, Themesis, image corrected. Here you as well, you can make all the in situ experiments, heating, et cetera. Uh, you can make high resolution, conventional um, TM. But for me, I really like this microscope as you can switch really easy between TM or STEM. This is an example of some uh, gold silver nanoparticles. We, are, we were studying the, the, the alloying process. They were becoming porous. And with the TM, we could study the crystal structure, how it's changing everything. And then how with the STEM, how was uh, getting this kind of porous. Um, we also have a Titan Themesis proof corrector. Um, this title is more focused to spectroscopy techniques. There we can study eels, EDS, high resolution STEM, among others. So the outline of my presentations, first I will start with a general introduction about how we produce synthesize these nanomaterials 
and for what we need them. Then I will move to the first project about the complex solid solution, these nanoparticles for oxygen reduction reaction. And we will study, well, I will show you what's happening when we have we will use different solvents, how the catalytic activities are changing. And also um, we study the thermal activity by in situ heating TM. And then the project number two, as is, again, we will study this ruthenium platinum catalyst nanomaterials and their degradations process uh, to improve the lifetime of the fuel cells. And finally, I will finish with a brief conclusion. We have two ways to produce our uh, nanomaterials, the top down and the bottom up. And inside of both, you can find the physical synthesis and the chemical synthesis. So in the case of the complex solid solution nanomaterials, we use what is called sputtering techniques to make them. And for the case of the ruthenium platinum, we use the solvothermal synthesis. But for what we need all these nanomaterials? So let me put an example. Imagine that we have here a fuel cell stack. We have an anode, we have a cathode. So the anode, uh, we, uh, we fill it with uh, hydrogen fuel and the cathode with oxygen. And here with, uh, with the catalyst, we can break the hydrogen bond. The, the, the membrane is proton exchange membrane. So the protons travel through the membrane, the electrons to the external circuit. And then together with the oxygen from there, we generate water and electricity in a clean way. So our complex solid solution nanomaterials are a good candidates to be used in the cathode, for example, in oxygen reduction reaction. And for the case of the fuel cells, I will focus more on the anode to study the hydrogen oxidation reaction. So let's go to study for the first nanomaterials. As I say, we produce the by, by continuous sputtering techniques, but what is this? So here we have a chamber. It's an ultra vacuum chamber where we can have a one target or multi-target. This target can be made for several elements or as, and the good part is also we can tune the atomic percentage of these elements. And here we have a wafer. So this wafer, we can grow a thin films or we can use this kind of wafers with holes where we can put our solvents and we can grow the nanoparticles inside. So far we produce material from two up to 13 elements. But today I would like to focus more on the Kinari system, uh, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and this iron is yeah, repeating because they offer really outstanding possibilities for uh, oxygen reaction, reduction reaction. And in our case, we use the ionic liquids because they are cells with these melting points less than 100 degrees. And they offer outstanding possibilities as a media for the synthesis of these nanoparticles. So they act as electronic and steric stabilizer. They can prevent the particles growth and degradation, and they have a strong effect on the morphology, but as well on the composition of these nanomaterials. So when we went to the TM and we check our, our nanomaterials, we start first with our standard ionic liquid. We call ionic liquid number two. I will show you later the, 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 stru the structure. So we realized that these nanoparticles were extremely small, around 1.2 nanometers and amorphous. So we did what is called in situ crystallization to grow them and to make them crystalline. And after 40 minutes, they became PCC. Here is a zoom in of this small region, which are completely this region. And here you can see these small nanoparticles already crystalline. And I would like to show you as well an, a video here is the amorphous uh, nanopart a single nanoparticle uh, starting this in situ crystallization. And as you see during, uh, we are making electron, we are focusing the electron beam, it's becoming, uh, it's growing, maybe from the single uh, atoms that are surrounding and uh, it's getting uh, crystalline. And really you can see the, the lattice fringes. And here I wrote two hours, but between 14 minutes and two hours, it was not any kind of change. We also were, wondering if we can do this in a ex situ way. So we call ex situ annealing time. Here we put the sample, we heat it up also as well in, in vacuum. We, had, we heat it up until 100 degrees. And after five hours, you can see how we get a growth of the nanoparticles and they start to become crystalline. After 10 hours, we reach the same point that we reached with the in situ crystallization. But after uh, 15 hours, we get a phase transition between BCC and FCC. And this is our motivation to study later the thermal stability of this kind of complex soil solution by um, heating, in situ heating experiments. 
We also check the composition of these uh, nanomaterials and we realize that even if we spot it with a completely, completely acryatomic composition, something happened because we have a, a high quantity of chromium, nickel and cobalt, but for manganese and iron, the concentration was really low. At this point, we were wondering if the atoms could enter inside the ionic liquid, if they are there and then it's not stable to grow together on the nanoparticles, or if the ionic liquids are acting as a kind of the barrier and then they cannot enter inside. And for this, this is our motivation later to study what happened with these nanoparticles when we use different um, ionic liquids. So what we did is we also make uh, ICPMS to check where are these elements, are they inside or not? So the ICPMS, you can get uh, the overall atomic composition from the nanoparticles, but as well for, for, for in what we have inside of the ionic liquid. And also, because we compare with the EDS that brings more what is the local nanoparticles composition. And what we realized is that indeed this kind of um, manganese was, it could not enter as the other elements inside of the ionic liquids. And later we'll, I will show you exactly why. After the characterization of these nanoparticles, we check the catalytic activity and how we did this. We did this with a process we call nanofishing. So what is nanofishing? First, we have the synthesis of our nanoparticles. Here, this scheme is with five targets, but we use one target, it's the same, and they grow inside of the uh, ionic liquid. Then we can immobilize this nanoparticle by using what we say nano impacts. And it, this is a nanocarbon uh, electrode, and we can extract them and we can transfer them to a stable electrolyte solution for measure the catalytic activity. Here I plot some of the, the, the systems we were checking. So I wanted to compare, also I put some bimetallic nanoparticles made for quaternary nanoparticles and kinari. So this is our excellent system. One, two, and new means that we did the, we check the, the properties more than one time. And in all the cases we get the same. Um, so as you can see for, as you can see for our kinari, uh, kinari system, we are getting an activity which is comparable to the, to the platinum that is represented in blue line. This open a new, uh, a new, new possibilities for this complex solution, solid solution nanomaterials because with them we can get rid of the novel metal catalyst and they also offer a unique uh, possibilities for tailoring the active size because we can adapt them, we can use the elements we want, we can modify the composition and you can adapt these systems to your desired applications. Now I would like to focus, also I would like to change to the second point is, okay, now we have our synthesis. We know they have an excellent activity behavior. So what's happening if instead of our standard ionic liquid, we have a library? How are these ionic liquids affecting on the growth of the nanoparticles and also on the catalytic properties? For this, we use uh, the number two. It, it was our standard ionic liquid for the first part of the characterization. And now we use five with the same base cation and we use initially four with the same base cation. But we discard completely the number nine because uh, the nanoparticles were really big and not stable. The rest of the nanoparticles, they are stable for years. So this is um, the wafer that we were using. We split it in every four holes. We put one ionic liquid. This is before and after the synthesis, you see here that we already get different colors. So indeed the ionic liquids are having some effect on the growth of these nano, nanoparticles. And again, we focus on the Kinari system. So here, what the first thing we realized when we um, check the catalytic properties is that we have three kinds of families. One family with lower activity than platinum, one family with the same activity that again is the number number ionic liquid two, and one formula which corresponds to one, six, seven, and eight with higher performance than platinum. So in order to correlate the, the, the synthesis with the, with the catalytic proper, properties, we use the TM. So we went to the TM or check these eight different samples, and we realized that, um, that we have different uh, average size from 1.3 nanometers up to 2.6. And we also have three different crystal structures. We get FCC for one and four, 
we get PCC for five, six, and eight, and we get amorphous for two and three. So we also check the, the, the local composition of these nanoparticles in the different ionic liquids and see in our standard ionic liquid number two, we, as we say, we get a really low quantity of manganese. But look, in under number three, we reach 19%. And why is this? And the opposite with nickel. So in the number three, we get just 3%, and the num but in the ionic liquid two, in the nickel, we get up to 24%. So this was a, li a little bit surprised. We also make ICPMS, and they were in agreement with the EDS measurements. So let me show again the, um, the catalytic activities and, and the morphologies of the, of the ionic liquids. And what we did is we tried to find some relations to explain the behaviors. So the first that we found is, is that the 90% of the 90 atomic percent of the manganese was only for the ionic liquid three. So if you check the, the structure, the morphological structure of this ionic liquid, the number three is the only one that doesn't have fluorine. So in this case, uh, if you want to get manganese inside, we need groups that doesn't bring fluorine. The same for the nickel. So maybe due to the, the, the specific morphologies of this ionic liquid, um, the nickel can enter inside. And look, in the case of the iron, here in the, in, the, in the number six, with a shorter ethylene change, we get less than 10% of iron, while in the number seven, we get much, much higher, almost 20%, I would say, or 15. And this means that iron likes uh, to have uh, longer chains. And our best system is the ionic, numbers, ionic liquid number six, where we have a BCC structure around 1.3 nanometers, where we have a high concentration of chromium, cobalt, and nickel, and low concentration of manganese and iron. So what we conclude is that the size of the nanoparticles and also the structure are affecting to the catalytic properties. But what affects most is the composition. Because if you see this, um, this uh, difference ionic liquid, in this case, the manganese was too too high, like more than 10%. And if we have a quantity of manganese higher than 10 atomic percent, the catalytic properties goes drastically down. So now following the, the scheme, I told you, we, will, we also study some, um, some thermal stability of a, uh, of a complex solid solution, but in this case, thin film, because we want us to start just with a thin film to avoid the influence of the ionic liquid to understand better what's happening. And our main mission was to make a thin film. Normally the thin films are around 50 to 100 nanometers, but we wanted a really thin, thin film around 10 nanometers. So for this, um, we use a normal carbon grid and also this kind of uh, heating chips. And um, this is an image where you can, in this heating chip, you can drop, uh, and if you have your nanoparticles in a solid, solid, colloidal solution, you can drop a, a drop and then you have here your nanoparticles. But what we did is we put this carbon grid and the heating chip directly on the, on the sputtering chamber and we just sputter. And for the characterization, we use this MEMS heating holder from the solution that they have six connection, six connections. Four of the connections are for the heating experiments and two for later if you want to check some bias. And after the sputtering in the normal carbon grid, we've uh, found that we have this kind of morphologies. It looked like we have a, a matrix here, a thin film, and on the top it's gross nanoparticles, or we call later island. We check the composition and just the normal single EDS maps, it gets a key atomic. But as you already can see, we have a segregation of nickel and cobalt on these nanoparticles, and the iron, manganese, and chromium are, it looks like, are more on the thin film. To confirm this, we use principal component analysis or non negative matrix factorization. And we've figured it out that indeed we have two kinds of components one component with a high quantity of cobalt and nickel for the islands, and for the continuous layer, we have a higher content of chromium, manganese, and iron. And we study the possible uh, growth of this. And for this, we make yields. And we realize that we have two different thickness. And the only mechanism possible that they can grow having two different thickness is uh, with um, a strand thick Krastanov growth type. We, we proceed with the in-situ heating experiment. So we start for the, for, 
for the room temperatures and we went up until 700 degrees. And at 700 degrees, we realized that we have sharper rings. And also two more reflections appears due to, maybe due to the uh, chromium oxide. So I forget to say that the island has an average size around two nanometers. And after the heating, we can see that we have two different effects. One effect due to the heating process, that it will be these nanoparticles where they reach uh, around 10 nanometers, but one effect due to the, the heating plus also the influence of the electron beam, where we grow for the nanoparticles and we found nanoparticles up to 95 nanometers. We also check um, the composition of the thin film after the, after the heating. And, and, and we figured it out that all the manganese went directly to the layer, that all the cobalt and nickel went to the island. So we have a kind of atom mobility and exchange. So the conclusions that we get from this investigation is that in this kind of thin films, we get this Stransky Krastanov growth type, that our mission was to study a thickness of around 10 nanometers, that the in situ heating and the additional electron beam uh, accelerates the, the aggregation process, the Oswald ripening. And I hope for the next time we are already working on checking the electrocatalytic properties and we use we want to use identical location that we are using now in the next project I will come. So now after the big part of the complex solid solution, I'm gonna focus on the study of this ruthenium platinum um, nanoparticles. Uh, catalyst that we are using on the on the fuel cells and we study them by identical location um, by tomography and some atom pro tomography but what do we need so the fuel cells nowadays it's the fuel cells are really trendy because we can generate energy in a clean way and already you can see some of the cars for example this toyota mirai that is powered by fuel cells and actually um, Germany is the first country that this year started uh, with a commercial um, trains powered by fuel cells. So we are working with uh, together with the partner Freudenberg Innovation, Innovation Together, and uh, we are more focused on designing fuel cells for buses at, and for, for ships. So let me put again the scheme of the fuel cells. Normally, as a catalyst, uh, we we tend to use platinum nanoparticles because they are high active for both reactions, but they have several problems. Really high price, volatile price, and low tolerance for the impurities, especially for the CO2. As nowadays, the hydrogen that we are using, it's not a green hydrogen, it's more reformate hydrogen. It brings a lot of impurities that kills our uh, catalytic material. So we designed two, two strategies. First, we start to make, to produce um, some alloys and some core shells. We th were thinking first that the alloys can bring better um, properties because they have a bifunctional and electronic effect, while the core shells we were thinking only it will bring electronic effect. But what is this about functional and electronic? Let me introduce a little bit. So in the case of the, the alloys, it has both. So the bifunctional effect is that the oxygen containing species can absorb on the ruthenium sulfide sites, and then it promotes the electro oxidation of the CO that absorbs on the, on the platinum. And then in the case of the electronic effect, the, ch the changes in the electronic bank structure of the platinum and the atoms can induce by this ruthenium weeks the CO platinum interaction, and then we reduce the CO2. But the main problem is that alloying, making an alloy with um, a less novel metal, like in our case, the, the ruthenium, decreased the stability of these catalyst nanomaterials. And for this reason, we start to study more uh, core shells. We protect them. Uh, we have a core of ruthenium. We have one or two layers of platinum because with one or two layers, we still have the electronic effect. And we were thinking that these catalysts are, uh, are optimum for the fuel cells. So when we make the, the synthesis by solvothermal, as I will explain you initially, um, and we check um, how are the morphologies and how are these nanoparticles, we were expecting that they are core shells. But here, this is a, a HADAF image, and for the ones which doesn't know, so in the HADAF, we have a Z contract. This means Z contrast. This means that the materials, with, well, 
of the elements with a higher Z, it will appear brightest. White with lower, gray. So in this case, the ruthenium has a lower Z than the platinum, appears gray, and the platinum appears brighter. And yeah, for me, when I saw this, I was like, okay, these are not correct shells. But we wanted to, to confirm it. And we study that we have ruthenium, one, one layer of platinum, and two layers of platinum. We also found that in these nanoparticles, the, the, the core we have two different average size. The core shells were around five nanometers, but we found a lot of small single nanopart platinum nanoparticles. They are marked in the yellow line. And in the case of the ruthenium to platinum, again, we found two different families. These are a little bit bigger and the families of the platinum. So for one layer, the 70% of the particles were core shell, while for the two layers, only the 60% of the particles were core shell. We also calculate some, some strains to confirm that the average um, thickness of the layer were corresponding to, to one layer or to two, la two layers, and we could make it, um, we could corroborate by checking the, the strain. And then we pass to do some tomography experiments because we really want to see how the platinum is covering the ruthenium core. So this is a, just a basic scheme to show you that maybe we have different morphologies. And when we look to the TM, they will look completely the same. So the tomography allow us to see exactly the, the in a 3D dimension. So this is the tomography for ruthenium and two layers of platinum and one layer. So as we can confirm it for one layer, the shell, this, we only plot the platinum shell. The shell is, it's, uh, so the shell cannot, it's not covering as much as in two layers. If they will be completely core shell, how we have to see? So we will see just a kind of a, completely a, a, yellow, a yellow ball. But as they are porous, we saw this kind of morphologies. And in this case, for EDS, we confirmed that this, the small particles were made of platinum. And the same here, we have hollows, okay, less than one layer, but we also have a small platinum particles. This is a, a summary of the, of the tomography we did for one layer and two layers from zero to 180 degrees to, to confirm that, that the shell is completely incom incomplete. And after the initial characterization of the nanoparticles, we produce to make some accelerated tests. We make 10,000 cycles because the accelerated test simulates the condition of these nanoparticles inside of the fuel cells. So we check it with hydrogen and with reformate. Again, with reformate, it brings this kind of impurities. And um, the initial state for one layer is the square, for two layers is the triangle. For two layers, so for both, it was the same performance. But if you see, for the reformate, one layer was higher performance than two layers. And, but after 10,000 cycles, what we could see is that the performance for one layer got even lower than for two layers for both cases. And later, we, I will enter against this to explain you exactly why. Well, this is exactly what I explained right now. So what we did is that after 10,000 cycles, we checked this, this mass. Basically, the mass are the carbon substrate that we deposit the, the nanoparticles to form this catalyt catalytic layer for the, for the fuel cells. This is, um, this is one layer and this image is two layers. And in both cases, we saw that the part closer to the membrane has a higher concentration of uh, core shell nanoparticles and the part more far away, we found a lot of platinum nanoparticles. And also it looks like all the ruthenium is diffusing. In the, in the case of one, one layer, we get up to 10% of ruthenium in the cathode side. This is the anode side. While in the case of two layers, we get only a 3%. We also make some PCA to confirm these two families and to check that this is that we have many, many, many of uh, small platinum particles. So we also make tomography after these 10,000 cycles for one and two layers. And what we found is that in the case of one, the ratio decreased around 63% during the accelerated test, while, while in uh, the case of two layers, there are no difference. So it looks like they are a little bit more stable. So what happened here? What we found is that 
let's focus on the reformate hydrogen here number one has a higher initial performance that with two layers why because in as you remember with one layer with one layer we figure it out we have 70 percent of core shell while in two layers we have just 60 percent and the contribution of the small particles can decrease the performance but the problem is after 10,000 10, cycles the layer number two it looks like it has higher uh, performance than one layer and this is due to because number two has a higher ruthenium protection from due to the, the platinum shell and doesn't doesn't allow the ruthenium diffusing uh, from the nanoparticles to understand better what is happening because here what we did we check before the fresh nanoparticles and after and we are really interested on in check what is going on during the during the middle we did what is called identical location tm basically we have a tm grid where we have letters so we can put our nanoparticles and we can find always the same region. There we start, we make a three electro setup to make our accelerated test. We put exactly the same conditions than before. And first I have, so the TM grid with our, uh, with our catalyst nanoparticles, it will work like a working electrode. And first we were using this kind of um, setup. But it was really bad because uh, we have two kind of cells. We were we having some leaking. We got a really horrible connection. So I will show you both results because this it was a nightmare for us. Finally, we we have a nice workshop at Max Planck, and we were designing our own um, identical location lab. We build our own small cells to have everything in one pot, and we adapt also the counter and the reference electrode to the to the original. Um, accelerated test. So here is with the first initial setup. This is initial fresh nanoparticles where we wanted to check uh, how, is, uh, how are they. And this was just only 400 degrees, completely a mess. But when we get better and better and we design our own setup, this is the initial state. Finally, we, call, we I just plot the five less uh, CVs to show you that they are so the first one they are they were completely noisy and here we could control them and we plot right now just until 500 500 uh, cvs but it brings a lot of information so the nanoparticles are moving and you see these kind of particles are now here together so we start to have some oswald ripening effect and aggregation and also we make some eds and we get a decrement of the ruthenium. So just with 500 cycles, the nanoparticles are starting to have some degradation process. Our aim is to do something like this. This is a former work from our uh, former colleague, from Dr. Henge. She was also studying nanomaterials for fuel cells. And what was she doing is she has the fresh nanoparticles, she was cycling, she was taking different cycles, and she was looking that uh, these nanomaterials has some aggregations, and finally, some dissolutions. And this is what we aim that maybe in September, I can show you more about this. As I explained, the, the impurities are killing the, the catalytic material. We consider the carbon monoxide from the reformate hydrogen, but there are more impurities which can really uh, contribute to the low performance of the fuel cells. And one of these is the chlorine. So to make our solvothermal, our nanoparticles, we use the solvothermal process and we use chlorine precursors. As the chlorine is a really in a low quantity, we were thinking that we can make some atom prof tomography and we can see where is this chlorine. We have not and where. For this, we develop a new electrophoresis process because for APT, we need a tip and then we will, we will uh, analyze this tip. But how we make a tip with the nanoparticles? So we have uh, we we use this strategy. We have a copper plate and we use cobalt um, a cobalt matrix. We put everything together and then we uh, we create this kind of cobalt matrix with our catalytic nanoparticles embed on it. Then we make uh, using a focus ion beam. We reduce our tips. We cover with the normal standard process. 
And we had this matrix with the nanoparticles. And finally, we can build this kind of APT specimen. And this is again all the process on the FIP. And then to check um, our composition from the tip, we have two ways. We can have a, 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 a voltage pulse or with laser. So due to the mechanical stress that the voltage pulse was using, we had to use laser. But the laser has the advantage that it hits the sample and it can bring some aberrations. But it works like when we had the laser, it can hit the tip. And then um, with the detector, you can check from where it is, X and E coordinates. Mm, due to the evaporation sequence, you can see how deep, which position is exact, the Z. And related to the, fly, the flight, uh, the time flight, it has the chemical identity of this your species. As I say, we are using laser plus we are using carbon. We have uh, we could we cannot reach atomic resolution, so we were thinking in make some um, stem APT anthropomorphic correlations to understand better. And for APT, finally, you have your mass spectrum. So to know exactly the influence or how are the correlations that they are made by ruthenium, platinum. First, we need to check the mass spectrum, the ruthenium, and then the platinum. So here I just put you our first step with the ruthenium nanoparticles. Uh, here we make this EDS to confirm that this ruthenium is it's here, and then uh, we start to plot. In the spectrum of the APT, we can see that we have these several impurities. So in this case, we were focused on the chlorine. And as you see, it was not possible to get um, Wait, wait. So the morphologies by stem was kind of a star nanoparticles, but here it was uh, a wrong shape. So we lost resolution. But what we found is that we have uh, chlorine atoms and it looks like these chlorines, uh, chlorines it, ions it, it are segregating on the surface of the nanoparticles. And this was an explanation of um, these nanoparticles, as I said before, they are in a carbon black substrate and the carbon is really challenging for APT because it has a high evaporation fields that brings really uh, trajectory aberrations. But we are working on it and I hope we can clarify more. And with this, I arrived to my conclusions. So we study uh, in situ TM, we study the growth mechanism of uh, nanomaterials. Um, also, we study the thermal stability by uh, heating experiments. The high resolution TM, STEM, EDS techniques, we can bring morphology, size, structure, and composition information. We also use tomography to know about uh, how are these, uh, the shell of the nanoparticles. And we also make correlative STEM APT to study in 3D these uh, impurities, which can kill them, the, the catalytic material. And for this, I would like to say thank you to, so this is a picture from the pandemic. We could not meet in person. We just took a, a picture on, on Zoom. And I would like to say thank you. This is uh, my group, the professor, Christina Shoy. And I would like also to say thank you to, to Bochum University for the help on the synthesis and on the measurement of the catalytic application and to my project members, uh, Mikel and Nico. And yeah. Thank you very much, Alba. So now it's time for questions. I think this is not working. I think it is. Ah. Yeah, it is, it is. Is there any question in the room? Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. I have a question about that. Um, because usually we suppose that the E beam, electron beam, that will uh, damage a crystal and be, uh, make a crystal become amorphous. But for your case, it's be, uh, from a amorphous and make it into a crystal. Yeah. I'm really interested in that. Why it happens? I think for me, it, <laughs> I think it depends of uh, your material and it depends of the of the conditions. I don't know which kind of those are you using so for our exact experiments we think with the electron beam we are giving energy to the system and with this energy it can organize and we also think we have some still uh, atoms surrounding that they can grow on the nanoparticles and they became crystalline but if you want we can check your system later and you can also show me which kind of material which are your conditions and we can have a look mm. 
for, for, for me, I work on the prostate oxide, but for me, usually when I uh, do the high resolution TM, uh, at the very soon, I, it's very become uh, very easy to become amorphous. Um, yes, but again, depends on the material because I okay. also, when I was doing these experiments, I get inspiration for several papers I was reading. And in these papers, they were also using the electron beam to make crystalline the materials. Oh, but okay. which material do you have? Oh, uh, proscat. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's different. Imagine the in your case when you were studying superconductors. Yes. In the YVCO, whenever you were focusing with your beam, you were destroying the material. Yeah, and, and getting he, it amorphous. Yeah. And when you have nanoparticles, sometimes you crystallize them. So yes. The other way around. Yes. yes. Okay. But in perovskites, that happens. <laughs> yeah. Damage the material and destroy it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other question? Thank you for your presentation. For the, the heating part, and uh, do you consider the time or the, the rate of the heating? It means, for example, you need the uh, 600 Celsius degree. You yes. reach this Celsius degree directly no, or? We make heat? it a step, exactly. So we hit 100, we wait half an hour, we hit 100, we make half an hour, we hit and like this. And then we, we hit it even farther of 700 degrees because what we want to see is uh, where, where is the, this in, where it doesn't become unstable, no? That makes this decomposition. So for this reason, we, wait, we, we hit up step for step and we stay with this temperature to see if we have some changes. Uh -huh. But I have to say that when we reach 700 degrees, it was really fast. In one second, look, it gets decomposed. So we have to optimize the the best condition yes. when check the the exactly. institute because for me it will not have sense to hit really fast uh -huh. you don't know at all where is the the barrier uh -huh. so i will have a smooth a smooth uh heating gram and then staying there so for a while to see if there is some changes or not okay so maybe it, it will spend a longer time to find the best yes. condition yes yes so you you have to make sure this this crystals change at the same time you have the enough time to exactly to catch exactly. this it's not easy when we started this experiment i think we reached 400 degrees and we were thinking okay they are stable but no no i wanted to really go further and then at seven it was at 700 degrees when it changed okay so it's this condition is the similar like the synthesized process or exactly it was we have in a spot ring and then we make a really thin uh, that's what it is oh i wait for it uh -huh. is the grid or the heating chip and uh, how large is that the wafer it's over the wafer that you you you, you yes, make the yes, spotting is mean... a tm grid uh -huh. or a heating chip okay that's it okay. and we really wanted to do thin films not higher to compare the stability from the thin films of, of around 10 nanometers over to the higher like 2000 from 50 to 200 because it has completely different behaviors and another one for your the the crucial structure you see i don't think this is a crucial structure yeah me neither yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's what i show you yes yes, isn't it? I agree. yes. according to the tomography we can make sure this is not a crucial yes structure. exactly yeah. and this is but this is good because what it was useful for us is um we we get now two publications one with the performance of the accelerated test uh -huh and one with the TM characterization. And it was good because with the TM, we can, could really understand why the performance was working like this. Why in one layer we had initially higher performance, but after 10,000, it goes really down more than two layers. And, and the TM was perfect to understand. So that's, that's you, you said that the one layer and two layer. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of one layer or two layer? You mean the shell, right? Yeah, exactly. One layer of a shell. Uh -huh. One. Uh, yeah uh, yeah it's not like the shell yeah no yeah the core is ruthenium and then you put one, one shell uh -huh. one cover or two covers so it depends on the, how many uh platinum you use we did it the opposite depends on the how many ruthenium you use okay so it's just to the, the platinum one... is always the same okay oh okay okay let's just to to compare the difference of one layer mm -hmm. two layers yes. yeah. 
that's not the the precisely one layer or two layer yes right. okay okay did you check the mix the the two uh, elements together to get the final which uh, is the meaning of the mix and the, the, the loy the, i mean the the plenum and the resinium mm -hmm. and the mix them it's similar like not the synthesize the crucial structure to check the the loy Yes, to check the properties. Of yes, and with the so if you mix means the loy that we just don't the have, physical mix, yeah. Yes, it has worse performance because all the ruthenium was uh, diffusing uh -huh. through the cathode. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. So apparently, the partial layer of platinum is protecting the ruthenium exactly. to go away. Exactly. But it's enough to let ruthenium work. Exactly. On surface. But you need maximum three layers of okay. platinum. Because then the electronic effects is killed as well. Okay. Then maybe you cover fully the ruthenium and it this cannot is our work. Our next step. Okay. So we just bring the information. <laughs> Freudenberg is the one which are doing the company, the synthesis of the nanoparticles and the um, and the performance of the fuel cells. Mm -hmm. Then we have another panel which was developing the membranes, and we have we make all the characterization. But on the membranes, I cannot show anything as they have a pattern. But this we realized not so long time ago. It was <laughs> not nice. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other question? I think you have some questions. Thank you for the talk. You're welcome. And just a um, quick question. I'm not so familiar with the fuel cells, but uh, when you do the accelerated test, do you cycle the voltage or the temperature? The voltage. The voltage. So how do you uh, define your procedure? Do you have a waiting time uh, when you're stepping the voltage, or is it more like a gradual thing? We make uh, first we make a CO stripping to calculate the exa of the nanoparticles, and then we start to cycle mm. from one with this. So it's just exactly, continuous exactly. cycling continuous with cycling. a small step, yes. or you make big steps? No, we and... make a small step, but the details that we have mm. to check. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a killing question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the beginning, to the first topic you were talking about. When you have different holes in which you produce your particles and you are using different, well, <laughs> a little bit further, it's when you were presenting that you were using nine different ah, ionic liquids reactors, yeah, with the ionic liquids, yeah, exactly here. So uh, you have the sputtering from, I don't know, sputtering from seven, eight, nine different elements, whatever. Five. Five, okay. And then uh, you are using different anions there or different... Uh... This is uh, ionic liquids, it's kind of salts. Okay, you have different salts, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you see that the reaction is pretty different depending on the ionic salt. Yes. Did you also try to change the positions of the sputtering? Yes, but no, no, no. As the... It doesn't change. No, it doesn't change because okay. we have one target on the center. Okay. And it's rotating. Okay, that's perfect. So, that's perfect. So it's nothing to do with the no. position of the target. No, no, no. Okay, okay. That's perfect. A good good way to prove that. <laughs> perfect. Is there any other question? No? So if this is not the case, we thank Alva again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we finish here <laughs> the seminar.